sure if it is a conflict of interest, but I'll take it anyway, for bylaws 2021-1. see this from the outside. 
you'll see in a moment. The top image shows more progress with the framing for the walls, with the steel studs, and the lower image shows the beginning of the roof line. And Hilary Murphy said to me just that week before that the roof line would make this to look like a real building, and it sure did. This was taken just last week. We now have a complete roof line awaiting the final steel, which I'm told was started today. The lower stone base and strapping as the support for the siding, which I think is next week's project. And here is one interior shot showing the magnificent roof cutting. A lot of wood in that building. It takes heart. Here are some highlights from our capital campaign. In May, we were proud to announce $400,000 in funding from the John M. and Bernice Carrick Foundation. To quote President Lyle Van Cleef, we certainly applaud the cities of Belleville and Quinty West for their leadership, which inspired the directors of the foundation. Shown in this Zoom image is Donna with their check, along with three-year-old Shih Tzu, well, mostly Shih Tzu, Scruffy, whom she and her husband adopted from us in November 2018. And in July, Bob Ledicka presented a check to board member Kelly McCaw and myself. This man took it upon himself to reach out to his extended network in the community of friends to support our new build. He had an initial goal of 2,500, then he moved it to 3,500, then he moved it to 4,500. With support from Canada Post and NorCal retirees, seniors on the go members, and Potter's Creek residents, the checks just kept coming in. That check that you see in this image was for $5,615. Bob is with us today, and I would like to ask him to stand to be acknowledged by Council and those in attendance. $250,000 
towards the construction of our community and education center. Accompanied by the Minister of Energy and NPP for Bay of Quinte, Todd Smith, both acknowledged the importance of a programming and rental facility that will bring community members together. Both ministers have adopted animals from our shelter. The It Takes Heart Capital Campaign for this $5 million center, we have currently raised $3.6 million in cash and pledges, representing 72% of our goal. I wish to remind Belleville Council that the cost savings by task force engineering last spring and into the summer, and most importantly, the loan guarantee of $1 million each approved by this council and those of Quinty West were pivotal, absolutely pivotal, in allowing the board to make this decision to move ahead with the simultaneous build of the two phases. We could not have done this without you. Your contribution of $400,000 in cash pledges, additional in-kind services of well over $250,000, as well as the loan guarantee allows us to protect and care for animals in need and to educate the public about animal welfare throughout our region. On behalf, on behalf of the Humane Society board, staff, volunteers, and animals, we thank you, the friendly and the compassionate City of Belleville. So that's it for our deputation. If you have any questions or comments, we'd be pleased to field them. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lowry and, and uh, Ms. Endicott. Um, it was approximately a year ago that we had that uh, Zoom call when you uh, contacted me um, with uh, the catastrophic news that your hot water had gone uh, down and that uh, there were serious problems. And I said, well, look, we can't stay there. We've got to do something. We need to figure out a way to have this project proceed. And then following our conversation, I had to attend an event in Quinty West. I spoke with Mayor Harrison, and, uh, and we both felt confident that our councils would support that additional $1 million each in a loan guarantee to allow you to start the project and to get going. And uh, to think that a year later, we are at... Um, where you've got a full roof on your facility and uh, you are looking down the barrel of when you'll be open. So uh, that is, that's great. And you know, and I think it just shows how, uh, how, how it matters here at the municipal level that in, in politics you can get things done and get things done quickly. And I'm so pleased that uh, the municipalities have stepped up and I'm uh, very happy to see the news that the province of Ontario has stepped up. Um, it's regretful that the federal government uh, hasn't contributed to this project. And it's equally regretful that um, a decision wasn't able to be done before the election was called uh, while we had a member of government uh, representing this region. So um, we'll have to find a way to uh, see if we can influence the federal government to, to come to the table with some funding. Uh, and if not, then our community will have to make up that, uh, that difference. So uh, ladies, um, I hope that you have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, you've earned uh, a great, uh, a great uh, holiday um, uh, and you're going to need the rest because 2022 will be very busy for you. Thank you. Colleagues, anybody else have any questions or comments they'd like to make? Councillor Alsop. Thank you, Chair, and I just want to take the time to thank you both for all the, the hard work you've done on this project, the persistence over the years. Uh, certainly this goal probably seemed out of reach for a long time. And, you know, now we're, we're so close, 72% raised, I just think it's phenomenal. And uh, I can tell you as a politician who's done some door knocking, I've never had a better reception when I told them I was there for the Humane Society. You can just see the weight come off people, you know? So I very pr much appreciate the opportunity to be a part of that, and uh, thank you for all that you do. All right. Thank you very much, ladies. So uh, colleagues, I'm looking for a resolution that the deputation by Donna Endicott, board chair, and Marilyn Lowry, executive director of the Humane Society Hastings Prince Edward, updating council on the progress of their new animal care and adoption center community and Education Center and Capital Campaign be received. Moved by Councillor Sanderson, second by Councillor Mollett. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. We'll now move to item 6-2. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Jennifer Goheen, the Senior Manager, Community Partners, and Neil Kennerney, a Manager, uh, Service Expansion of Rogers Communications, who will make a presentation to Council 
regarding the expansion of uh, internet service in our community. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Your Worship and uh, Local City Council. My name is Jennifer Goheen, and this is my colleague, Nathan Ring. We are here today representing Rogers Communications, and we will be presenting Rogers Broadband Expansion Plan for the City of Rogers. We have a few items on our agenda today. We will discuss Rogers, in, Rogers Commitment in Canada, how we will help communities thrive, and our commitment to delivering rural and remote connectivity. Neil will then go through an overview of the proposed Rogers Belleville Bill and how we engage and partner with the Council. We all have some frequently asked questions to share as well as comments as well. This slide highlights how Rogers is serving and investing in Canadian consumers, businesses and community communities and shows how plans like we're going to show you today continue our investment in Canada. Rogers has been investing in Canadian networks for decades with $60 billion invested since the 1990s. In 2020, our investments and operations in Canada generated $21.9 billion and over 68,000 jobs. We have over 25,000 employees in Canada with 16,000 employees in Ontario. We released our first ever environmental, social and governance report in April and some highlights include awarding $4.5 million in scholarships with over 400 recipients in Ontario. At Rogers, we help communities thrive. It is our responsibility to empower Indigenous, underserved and rural communities of Ontario with programs and connectivity improvements to bridge the digital divide and support community priorities. The digital divide has not been more prevalent than over the pandemic. Many people were faced with connectivity challenges when trying to work or attend school online. We recognize a build like we're discussing today is very much needed in these underserved areas. By building with fiber, speeds of up to 1.5 gigabits per second will be available immediately and will also effectively support much fa faster speeds as technology advances. This will enable video calling, online schooling, remote work of all kinds, uses, use of streaming services and cloud computing. Our intent is to keep the troops the fiber network at no cost to Belleville or its residents. We are here for our communities. We are expanding in new communities and want to become a part of these communities. We have a rich history in community support shown by a few programs highlighted here. To name a few, our Ted Rogers Scholarship. There was one award winner in Belleville in 2020. Rogers Hometown Hockey, which was in Belleville this year and I'm sure many are familiar with. And Connected for Success, which offers high speed, low cost internet to subsidized tenants, to seniors, to families with children and to individuals receiving disability and income support. Rogers is committed to working with intention with Indigenous communities. This means we will operate in ways that respect Indigenous self-determination and through a lens that acknowledges the history of Indigenous peoples in Canada. We are committed to delivering rural and remote connectivity and bridging the digital divide throughout Ontario and many other parts of Canada. Through partnerships with all levels of government and support from government programs such as the Universal Broadband Fund and EORN, we have committed millions of dollars to bring broadband and wireless connectivity to hundreds of communities throughout Canada. Uh, one example is SWIFT, where there are seven ongoing builds, including in Dufferin, Norfolk, and Oxford counties, with some construction already completed this fall. We are investing in communities in New Brunswick. We have been awarded funding from the CRTC's broadband fund to bring high-speed high connectivity to the Storytown area and the village of Doaketown, New Brunswick. Rogers will expand its network by 120 kilometers and will serve about 450 homes and 36 businesses. In British Columbia, Rogers has invested in LTE enhancements and 5G connectivity to more than 250 communities across cities, towns, rural and remote locations, providing critical technology where British Columbians needed it most. Additionally, we're investing more than 350 million in Rogers fully funded proactive bills in underserved areas across the province of Ontario. To name a few examples, we recently announced a $188 million investment in the Ottawa region to expand our fiber network, delivering fiber to the home technology, servicing more than 24,000 homes and businesses in Ottawa, Clarence Rockland, North Grenville, Carleton Place, and Beckwith. 
And finally, we announced a $140 million investment to connect upwards of 20,000 homes and businesses across Quinty Region, creating new economic and socioeconomic opportunities in communities like Belleville, Quinty West, and Prince Edward County. Thank you, Sunil. Good afternoon. <coughs> so uh, where, we're going, where are we going in Belleville? Um, it is uh, estimated that there's 764 underserved premises in Belleville. Uh, the, the map here shows all of the, um, the segments in red, the road segments, is what's identified from ICED as being underserved road segments, and that makes up the 764 underserved premises. Our timeline to build and design um, has started. Uh, sorry, the design and engineering has started, and then the target for completion is 2024. And um, additional homes likely will be added when surveying the area, so the 764 uh, homes past the center will increase. Next slide, Roger. <coughs> Roger's uh, commitment to benefiting the community means more than just uh, fiber to the home. We will engage the community throughout our build process, engaging with landowners and stakeholders, driving community impact, economic benefit, revenue, and improved coverage. We'll support local politicians and stakeholders with opportunities to tell their stories related to the investments, photo ops at community events, new site builds, joint storytelling, etc. We will strive to create jobs and economic development, increase revenue for local companies through our build and local partnerships. We will partner with local businesses and their tele telecommunication needs, including 5G innovations and applications. We are committed to helping those in need through financial and in-kind community contributions. Rogers will directly contribute to communities in Belleville through programs and events. We will ensure Indigenous engagement is a top priority, including local hiring for businesses. Um, <clears throat> the frequently asked questions in regards to the build is how do we determine how the homes are underserved? The uh, ICED, which is the Innovation Science and Economic Development Group of Canada, their data sets that determines which homes are considered underserved. These data sets are based on ongoing consultations between ICED and internet service providers, the CRTC, industry associations, provinces, territories, and other stakeholders. How can I find out if my home will be included in the build? You can confirm whether your address is considered underserved, uh, the link attached here at the National Broadband Internet Serviceability Map. This is. Um, a map provided by the federal government to show where all the underserved addresses are located. If your address is not cons considered underserved but you feel it should be, you can submit your address to the uh, service expansion at rci.rogers.com and we will confirm on the uh, <coughs> and get back to you. When will Rogers come to my area? We do not have a confirmed time at this time but we can continue to communicate regularly with residents to ensure everyone is aware when they can expect construction and services to be available. Um, how do I know what type of line will be run to my home? This is typically aerial or underground um, installation. Our technicians will determine this and what's best, what's best for each home based on the installation at the time of the build. Will this project improve my cell coverage and area? There is a separate initiative underway where we are partnering with EORN and investing the 300 million to expand the wireless connectivity throughout Eastern Ontario. And then finally, how do I sign up for services? We will be reaching out to residents through various methods of email, mail, door-to-door, -door, to gain consent to connect their home to the new network. Further details and services will be available at that time, and you can also see our product offerings at www.rogers.com. And yeah, thank you very much. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. So uh, a couple questions. So I understand that uh, you've received $140 million to connect about 20,000 households in the Quinty region. And so when you made application for those funds, there must have been some type of a schedule, uh, anticipated uh, commencement, as well as uh, finalization uh, periods. Can you share with us any information on that? So actually, the build that we're doing in this region is fully funded by Rogers. Okay. Uh, we have got builds going on in other areas that are subsidized by various programs, but this one is fully funded by Rogers, so okay. we're not tied to a schedule. Okay, wonderful. So when do you anticipate that you'll be uh, starting um, the work? Uh, when, when can residents anticipate that you'll be connecting them uh, in some of these underserviced areas? 
Our plan is to have the work all finalized by the end of 2024. Um, we are work starting already with some design surveying the areas will start soon. We'll get folks out into the neighborhoods and figuring out exactly where we, the routes we will be taking and the homes we will be connecting. That should be happening shortly. Okay. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about that because we've got, uh, you can imagine, there are a lot of people that are very anxious. Uh, they've uh, gone through this pandemic with uh, at-home learning and they've been working from home and they've been uh, very frustrated with their, uh, with their service that obviously needs to be upgraded. And so we're uh, at the last part of 2021. So if you'll be completed by the end of 2024, if, if I understood your, your point co correctly, um, when will you be able to share a build-out schedule with us? So, because uh, I, I, I would assume you're going to roll this out um, in, a, in a orderly manner, meaning that you'll extend service, so you'll build it at that point. So you won't get to the end at the beginning. You'll start, you yep. know, A, then B, then C, then D. So um, when will they have a, an understanding of what the schedule will be? So the uh, understanding of the schedule will be um, likely three, three to six months of the full schedule. Because um, what, what, what's going to take place now is uh, our survey team is going to go out and identify all of these homes within these underserved areas. And once they identify that, they have to come up with, uh, with a network plan. And once they come up with the network plan, then they, then they can decide on the build plan. And that's when they start putting the schedules together. And a lot of that's based on permits, um, underground and aerial hydro attachment permits and that as far as how the scheduling goes. Okay. So uh, I think it was the summer um, I had a virtual meeting with folks from Rogers. Uh, we talked about this exciting news. Um, we knew um, we were able to share information that you already have pre-approval. Uh, we have a standard agreement that we've come to uh, to work with Rogers on, so you can run on municipal services, and, and we've got a good relationship with you. So, so that is going uh, going well. It's now uh, it's now December, and so you think it'll be another six months before you can start sharing parts of the schedule with us? And it's like th three to six months, depending on how successful the survey is. Um, with winter uh, coming upon us now, it does make it difficult for us to survey the actual road conditions, and you know you know, pick, pick our build routes per se. Sure. So okay. they will be surveying the, um, the hydro poles in the area and also the underground conditions. So okay. that could be anywhere from three to six months. Okay. I, I know, you know, you know, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm nope, just trying to, the, 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 we get asked these questions all the time. People want to know when, because yeah. uh, it's, already, it's already too late in their minds um, right. and, and we're there. The last uh, question I guess I have is, uh, can we go back to that screen where you had the identified areas of underservices, yeah, with all those red marks. So I can't, um, I can't see here. Um, so I see you've identified. Um, it, it's the areas in the in the solid red lines. Yes, that's correct. The right. darker so pink red lines. Are is the Harmony red Road on uh, one of those lines? No. Uh, is there anything we can do to get Harmony Road on that line? <laughs> And the reason why I raise that is that we probably have the two most vocal uh, residents about uh, future in the city of Belleville. They're actually here at the meeting today as well. And they would want to know uh, about that because they, of course, um, as, uh, as educators and professionals and with families have really endured a lot. So um, is there any, any ability to deal with uh, Casey Road and Harmony Road and Blessington Road uh, and those um, if they're not identified on the map now? Yes, certainly we can look at including those. Right now what we have is solely the data from ISEC, and this is what they consider underserved. But we, we recognize that there are also homes that would be considered not well served. And okay. given that we are fully funding this build, we have an opportunity to look at where we're covering, so we could definitely take a look at those and see how we could incorporate it. Okay. Uh, and lastly, before I turn over to my colleagues, see if you have any questions. Is there anything that we can do to be of further assistance to expedite this process? You know, again, you have pre-approval from a permits point of view to be able to uh, to work with the city. Our staff are, are great, and uh, and and they're, they they will. I can tell you that this is a priority for council, so they will uh, ensure that things are moving quickly. And if they're not, if there's a holdup, you call me directly, and we will get that that fixed. Uh, is there anything else that can be done on our part to help with this? Uh, to help Rogers provide uh, faster service to our residents. Yeah, just um, you know, just helping us with the permit process. I mean, it is a process um, for 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 your planning team to review the documentation, like you know, 
and following their own process. It's just within a timely manner so that we can get out there and build. Um, just your support on that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's about it for that. Okay. Well, I can assure you that that will be done um, very timely. Right. Um, and as soon as you can get it in, then we can consider it. Okay. We can't consider it if we don't have them in, so we'd like right. to see that. Colleagues, uh, any questions from anybody on, on this? Councillor Kelly. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, uh, Mayor, through you. First of all, uh, Jennifer and Neil, thanks for the uh, presentation today. And I know you're here with uh, Marnie Miron as well, part of your uh, Rogers team. So uh, just a couple of comments. It's really positive to hear uh, about the work you're going to do uh, with rural and, and the city, because we hear it all the time uh, in the last couple of years, as the mayor touched on, uh, students in Belleville even struggle with internet. Mom and dad are working at home or grandparents with them, so that's uh, good to see, um, because it is uh, the way we live now, and you would know that better than I. And uh, I just wanted to say, I think it's really important that uh, big corporate companies like Rogers come to municipalities and kind of share their story and share what's out there. When we think of Rogers, we think of the baseball stadium in Toronto and the Blue Jays and the Rogers store at the Queen Mall, and I think that's fair for everybody. But when you come here and you just talk about your commitment to the environment, you touched on education with the grants, and I know there was a, also uh, someone, a young student from Brighton won some money this past summer. So uh, that tells me that you're building partnerships not just in the big cities, and uh, I'm hoping that we can work closely with your agency, I mean, with your company, I was on the Rogers website, there's lots of dollars for community events and there's been a big push in the city of Belleville to be more inclusive, have more festivals, and I know that Rogers offers some funding there, so we'd like to build that relationship with corporate company. And thank you for coming, because I think your message is not just about cell phones, it's about building relationships across the country, and thank you for coming. Uh, my final question, oh, I wanted to say this too. Thanks for coming with Rogers Hometown Hockey. Our city had a chance to go coast to coast to coast, mm -hmm. to showcase all the exciting things, free advertising. We could not pay for that, but thank you very much. And my final thing, um, just if you have any inside scoop, will the Blue Jays be offering Vladdy a long-term contract? <laughs> <laughs> totally separate department, so I'm not sure we can answer that one, but yes. Good. Very much echo everything you said. As my role in community partners, very much exactly what we're trying to do here. Thank so that's you. great. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Carr? Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's great uh, to see this uh, project come through with using corporate money versus uh, government money all the time. Um, similar question to the mayors on timing. Um, I know that well, there's a couple other internet providers and competitors out there doing some build work as well. Uh, one impediment they come into is Hydro One and access to the poles. And I know one in internet provider has basically stopped because of uh, pole access. That's not necessarily uh, in our wheelhouse, uh, but if it's something that is an impediment that we could certainly uh, communicate a push for, we'd like to know about that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's certainly an impediment and unfortunately uh, we're kind of bind by the rules from the uh, from ESA, which is the Electrical uh, Safety Authority. Anytime we, um, we apply to attach to, uh, to a hydro pole, we need to get a, a third party engineer to re-engineer the pole and ensure that it, it meets safety requirements. And if it doesn't, the pole needs to be replaced and that, that's at our cost. So in those cases, we would most likely um, go underground. And, and as long as there's not a bedrock situation that we're, um, we're installing, uh, <coughs> or, or trying to install underground bedrock. And then there's the option of us putting up our own poles on the opposite side of the road, and that's where the the town can come in and, and help us with with approval for that and allowing us to do so. Okay, great, thank you. Anyone else? Good. Well, thank you very much, and uh, and, and certainly thank you to uh, to Ms. Miron for uh, for being here. She was the one that originally set up the meeting last summer with us, and uh, she has a local connection, of course, to our community. And it's great to have you all. Thank you for making the trip. Uh, today and sharing this information. Um, I think before you leave, there'll be a couple of people that will have some specific questions sure. in the audience for you, okay. um, and good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, colleagues, I'm looking for a resolution that the deputation by Jennifer Goheen, Senior Manager, Community Partners, and Neil Kennerney, 
Manager Service Expansion of Rogers Communication regarding Rogers Broadband Expansion and Belleville be received. Moved by Councillor Alsap, second by Councillor Sanderson. All in favor? It's carried. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we will move on to item seven, correspondence. Uh, Lexicon Energy Community Report. Uh, this is for the second quarter, 2021. And I'm looking for a resolution that the Lexicon Energy Community Report Q2 2021 be received. Moved by Councillor Alsap, second by Councillor Millette. Um, and just before we call question, I, I just want to state, because uh, I know this came up during um, some of our, uh, our previous budget discussions or discussing the, um, the um, medical recruitment, uh, uh, recruiting of medical professionals for our community and, and the ability for Alexicon. Um, I'm very, very proud to be able to report that uh, Alexicon has met its forecast for distributions to uh, all of the community partners uh, in 2021. So the uh, final, uh, uh, what they call the true up, the uh, final distribution was approved last week at the Alexicon board meeting and uh, we will be getting exactly what they had forecasted and what the treasurer used as part of their estimate. So that's, uh, that's great news. Uh, 2022, uh, we will uh, get information about that early in the first quarter regarding what their anticipated uh, earnings and distributions will be so that we can plan properly for our operating budget. All in favor, it's carried. And so we'll now go to item number eight, Committee of the Whole. I'm looking for a motion to go into Committee of the Whole to hear and consider reports passing and recommendations and resolutions with myself and the chair. Moved by Councillor Alsap, seconded by Councillor McCaw. All in favor, it's carried. So we'll move to 8A and uh, the agenda shall include under reports items that warrant individual attention for council. There are two today, we'll start with 8A1. Proposed water and wastewater rates for the City of Belleville effective January 1st, 2022. It is the Manager of Finance Deputy Treasurer's Report number DDF 2021-06 and the resolution is that pursuant to report number DDF 2021-06 the rates for water and wastewater be included in the consolidated rates and fees bylaw for council's consideration. Moved by Councillor Sanderson, seconded by Councillor Alsap. Um, thank you. Anyone have any questions or reports included in your package? Anyone have any questions? I'll call, oh sorry, uh, Councillor uh, Thompson, go ahead. A couple of questions, uh, and I realize that water rates and sewer rates have to go up every year to maintain our city the way it is. But a uh, couple of questions: uh, the rate increase that I understand is 2.1 percent for water rates. Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, the uh, manager um, and the deputy treasurer uh, to come forward. Good afternoon. Brandon, how are you? Good afternoon, very well, thank Good. you. Good, you, uh, did you hear Councillor Thompson's question? I did, uh, and through the Chair, Councillor Thompson, the water increase is 2.1%. Uh, implicit in the rates as well, we have a wastewater uh, rate. It's a, sorry, can you hear yep. me okay? Yeah. I'll use my uh, Councillor Kelly voice. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, there, there's two parts to the overall rate for water and wastewater. There's the water rate as well as a wastewater rate. It's actually a surcharge, so it's a percentage of that rate uh, is charged for the wastewater operation. So they're both user funded. The water rates have increased by 2.1%. And as we've mentioned uh, previously, there's some, some pretty large pressures on wastewater for capital contributions and the, the requirements that we'll see there. So it's increased, the surcharge has increased uh, in addition to that, so it's more of a, a 5% increase. When you average that out, the total increase that a resident will see on their wastewater for about 18 cubic meters is about 3.34% for the overall increase. About $3.81 a month. The, um, and it was uh, just this council also give a a discount to um, Prince Edward County of $45,000, is that correct? There was a resolution to reduce the rate. Uh, the annual amount for that would be about $40,000 estimate. And what do you expect to um, bring in with the rate increase uh, of 2.1 percent or $3.34 percent per month What's the approximate bring-in during that one year and that amount 
increase? The additional amount of funds that will be Yes, uh, the additional required. revenue that will generate. Uh, so we'll have about $500,000 of water revenue, additional rate generation there, and about $700,000 of wastewater um, funds. So um, if I recollect correctly then, um, that's about uh, 10%, no, that's what percent, that's about 20% of the full impact that we've given away? The, the impact of the Prince Edward County um, reduction is, is pretty much negligible on the rate increase. If factored into um, the, the charges, it wouldn't really make much of a, an increase on the overall charge at all. It would be neutral. Okay, and I, um, I, I just, I'm bringing these points up because I was one that, uh, out of uh, nine votes, I was one that voted against the the rate uh, reduction, but I, I think it's important that um, we keep that structure um, as important in our minds that when we do give a discount, um, someplace we have to make it up. Even though it's only forty-five or forty thousand dollars, we still have to make it up in this rates. And if we don't increase rates, um, and if we hadn't given the forty-five or given the discount, not given the money away, given the discount, we could have come down another small percentage point in our rate increase. And as I said to everybody, there's only one taxpayer in the city, and uh, we pay the taxes, sewer and water. And we know that, um, and I think I'd ask you to give us a comparison in rates, um, and I still would like you to, to um, give us some sort of comparison to what our rates are compared to other municipalities. Uh, through the Chair, uh, Councilor Thompson, in the last page of the report, there's uh, some comparators. Going through the residential, a, a smaller commercial, as well as like a larger industrial. Uh, and you'll see uh, our rates are quite competitive. So we're, we're then, so when we get discussion from taxpayers, uh, my concern is that we're staying competitive with the surrounding area in our rates. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Mr. Ferguson, I, I know Councillor Thompson wouldn't want to mislead people, and I think his question was misleading in the sense of uh, the agreement we have with Prince Edward County. So, Prince Edward County uh, uh, purchases treated water from us, correct? They don't uh, handle the wastewater side of it. That's correct. Right. So, we are selling uh, a bulk amount of water to Prince Edward County, and the discount is on the purchase. If we didn't sell that water, we would still have all these pressures on increased costs, uh, but we wouldn't have any of that income even with the, the smaller amount, correct? Yep. So if we didn't sell water to Prince Edward County, we'd have a higher increase on the water side because we wouldn't have that revenue to offset it. And, uh, and I think we all, we all should know that uh, because it's, um, it's perpetuating a falsehood by saying that uh, giving Prince Edward County, who was buying a significant bulk water purchase, is actually caught at the expense of city taxpayers. We wouldn't be receiving the funds. In fact, it would drive up our costs even more. So I think it's important that we, uh, we are clear on that. Um, I understand that Prince Edward County doesn't want to pay additional funds, um, and I can let everybody know that they have taken this now to uh, a mediated or an arbitrated process uh, that we will have a third party that will decide on those water rates, but certainly we have invited Prince Edward County uh, that they should consider uh, supplying their own water needs uh, rather than purchasing for us in the future because we're confident that the growth of the city in the future will outweigh the amount of water that we're currently selling to the county. So I just want to make sure that everyone is clear on that. Any other questions or comments on this? Councillor um, Millett. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And through you to uh, Brennan or whomever can uh, answer my question. Uh, I noticed that um, in the breakdown here, we have a uh, uh, com uh, statement compared to previous projections, water rate increases have been reduced due to better than expected residential and general service consumption. Can you just explain uh, how that better than expected uh, turned out, or is it is that through conservation uh, efforts, or uh, I, I just wasn't clear on how that came about. Yep, uh, through the chair, Councillor Millat. Uh, we were we were quite conservative when we were doing our estimates, especially during COVID, as to the impacts that uh, consumption for water and wastewater. Uh, so uh, from last year's. Uh, 
consumption figures, we actually outperformed residential consumption was up uh, quite significantly, uh, given that uh, a fair amount of people were at home using water. So that's driven up uh, consumption, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyone else on this? Good. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ferguson. And, you know, again, I think this report also demonstrates that uh, we have an excellent uh, water and wastewater system in the city. It's the largest in the region. Uh, we are of, uh, have had uh, excellent service in the past, and we're protecting ourselves moving forward, and our rates are very competitive. And uh, those who uh, complain about the increases, uh, they also uh, are comp trying to compare water rates uh, from a time when fuel was 70 cents a litre, and it's now $1.40. And those costs have all driven up, and, uh, and we have to continue to provide safe and, uh, and, pot and, and good uh, quality drinking water, which we're doing. Um, with that, I'll call the question. All in favor? It's carried. Item A, A2, purchase of a new 2022 4x4 articulated multi-purpose utility sidewalk machine with plow and sander attachments. It is General Manager of Transportation and Operation Services Report Number GMTOS 2021-22. The resolution is that in accordance with Section 30.3, sole and single sourcing, approval and reporting of the City's purchasing bylaw number 2021-99, the quotation from FST Canada Inc. operating as Joe Johnson Equipment be accepted for the supply and delivery of a 2022 4x4 articulated multi-purpose utility sidewalk machine with front plow and sander attachments in the amount of $189,510.04 and that the Mayor and City Clerk be authorized to sign the acceptance agreement on behalf of the Corporation of the City of Belleville and that the City Clerk be authorized to affix the corporate seal. Moved by Councillor Alsop, seconded by Councillor Carr. Any questions or comments on this? Seeing none, all in favour? It's carried. We'll now move to uh, 8B consent items where Council may adopt consent items by one motion, but prior to consideration of such motion, members may request that specific items be removed from consideration under such motion and Council shall consider such items individually. I'll go around the table. Uh, Councillor McCaw, anything you'd like to pull? No, thank you. Councillor Sanderson? No, thank you. Councillor Alsop? Uh, 8B2 and 8B14. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson. No, thank you. Councillor Carr. No, thank you. Councillor Feeney. No, thank you. All right. Uh, Councillor Millette. Uh, 8B10, please. Councillor Kelly. No, thank you. All right, so then the resolution is that uh, the following agenda items be approved with the exception of items 8B2, 8B10, 8B14. Correct? Uh, I'll call, ask for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Carr and Councillor Alsop, any, uh, all in favour? It's carried. So we'll move to the individual items starting with 8B2. Recommendation report for proposed zoning uh, bylaw amendment bylaw number 10245 for 57 Octavia Street, City of Belleville. The owner is Juan Hernandez. The agent is RFA Planning Consultant Incorporated and it is file number uh, B77-1150. It is the principal planner's report number PP2021-70 and the resolution is that the Planning Advisory Committee recommends the following to City Council that zoning bylaw amendment application B77-1150 respecting 57 Octavia Street be denied. It's moved by Councillor Alsop, seconded by Councillor Carr. Councillor Alsop, you raised this, so go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to speak to this issue, um, as I, I do support uh, Juan Hernandez in his effort to uh, have the property rezoned. Uh, I actually used to live about 100 metres away from Mr. Hernandez and saw the operation uh, on a, essentially a daily basis. Uh, I think that he does provide something that is, is a beneficial to the community, particularly given the uh, demographics of that particular neighborhood. We do have a lot less people that drive in that neighborhood. I think the proximity was something that a lot of people appreciated, as well as the variety of items that were sold. And uh, I know that obviously uh, this did not come about in the correct way. Uh, however, I'm much more interested in seeing someone become compliant than become punished. Uh, and I think that uh, provided that he would be willing to become compliant, have the structure rebuilt and some of those other things that would be necessary, uh, I would support him being rezoned. So I just want to, to voice my opinions on that matter uh, and that I will not be voting in favour to deny the application. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Anyone else on this item? All right, uh, so the motion is to deny the um, application. All in favor? It's carried. Um, next item is 8B10, City of Belleville Grant Committee. It is the Director of Finance Treasurer's Report Number DF 2021-19, and the resolution is that Council approve the recommendations of the Grant Committee as outlined in the Director of Finance Treasurer's Report Number DF 2021-19, City of Belleville Grant Committee, it's moved by Councillor Mollette, seconded by Councillor Carr. Councillor Mollette, you had raised this item. Go ahead, sir. Yes, it's uh, just one quick question on that report, and I probably could have got it before I came here and raised it. Uh, I see uh, under new business uh, a series of uh, uh, a series of grants. Sorry, uh, from brought forward by your worship. Bottom one, Canadian Mental Health. Uh, for five thousand dollars, is that Canadian Mental Health Association or is that the Enrichment Center? I just wanted a little it's clarification. CMHA. It is CMHA. Yeah, the Enrichment Center, right? Yes, yeah. that's the intention. Well, CMHA and the Enrichment just Center are now two different entities, but. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Thank, you. Okay. thank you. Good. Anyone else on this item? I'll call the question. All in favor? It's carried. And then we'll move to 8B14, which is the Kiwanis Skateboard Park. General Manager, Transportation and Operation Services, Report Number GMTOS 2021-23. Uh, and the resolution is that the General Manager of Transportation and Operation Services, Report Number GMTOS 2021-23, regarding the Kiwanis Skateboard Park, be received as information. Moved by Councillor Alsop, seconded by Councillor Millett. Uh, Councillor Alsop, you had raised this item. Go ahead, sir. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to General Manager Reed for the report. I had requested this, so I just wanted to speak to you very briefly. I think the solutions outlined in the report would be great, and I just look forward to seeing them implemented, and uh, I appreciate you getting this looked at for us. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Millett. Yes, thank you, and uh, I concur. Um, it, uh, this is in no way taking away from the generosity of the, uh, the individual uh, company Mentos that... Uh, did uh, some upgrades to that park. It's just that uh, in uh, consultation afterwards with uh, some in the skateboard and the cycling community that use that facility, it became clear that some of the decisions uh, to place some of these items uh, were perhaps not the best thought out. And, and the improvements, uh, for instance, to the bowl to add highlights for some areas. And I, I spoke to uh, my colleague, Councillor Alsop, about this. I, I think these are acceptable solutions for now, and to monitor the other, uh, the other basketball net is fine. But I mean, it in no way takes away from the uh, the appreciation I think the city has for the generous uh, donation of of uh, the facility upgrades. Uh, but it did need a little bit of fine tuning, I guess, is the uh, the way to put it. So, thank you. Okay. Anyone else on this? Yeah, so I'll just, uh, I'll just say, I, I also want to, first of all, I want to thank Councillor Alsop for bringing this forward in the way that he did. It allowed uh, uh, General Manager Reed to be able to go back and take a look at it. Um, this was an unusual uh, situation, and uh, in hindsight, uh, certainly I would handle it differently um, if it was to present itself again on the front end of it. Um, you know, obviously, sometimes we make assumptions in life, and they don't end up uh, end up happening. But um, you know, certainly, uh, I will I will be uh, careful not to make the mistake again in terms of how we proceed with something like this. Um, but I am grateful for everybody uh, working together to find a solution, and I think the uh, suggestion here is uh, is much better and makes a lot more sense. Um, I had asked everyone else if they had anything else to say. Councillor Thompson, um, I don't know, did, did uh, do you have something you want to add? I just want to uh, add that um, a lot of work went in this and uh, maybe the right uh, end decision wasn't 100% uh, but I certainly don't want to downgrade Mentos. Um, they made a very generous contribution to our city. Um, there was some discussion made um, and some um, answers were done and some decisions were made and as again with all projects uh, did we do it 100% the way we are going to end up with? But um, with um, our manager, Roland K. Brown and Joe Reed, 
uh, some decisions were made with consultation with mentors. We certainly don't want to lose the future opportunity to mentors to be involved in future projects. And I certainly wouldn't hope that, or would hope that we would uh, convey to them that um, uh, their generosity was great. And I was part of that conversation and disturb it. And I, I, I don't want to make it look as if Mentos was at fault or our staff was at fault. Um, we all look at projects in a different way at the end. And I think with these minor changes, and I talked to uh, Councillor Alsop about it and uh, on the phone, and he was the one that brought it up. We made some minor changes, and I think we'll, um, we're always going to look for changes in any project. But I certainly want to make sure that Mentos is not looked bad on for this project because they already told me that if they were happy, that there might be other money in the future for projects. So um, I just want to make sure that Mentos is not downgraded here. Thank you. Um, before I call the vote, um, General Manager Reed, um, is there sufficient funding in the original uh, contribution to cover the adjustments that we have to make now? including if we have to resurface the, um, the bowl, um, or will this be a cost the city will be picking up? Uh, through the Chair Dowell Council, the, uh, there w this was an in-kind donation, so there was no funds transferred um, to the corporation, so we'll just have to absorb any cleanup costs within our operating budget. Yeah. You know, again, I think uh, when I had a meeting with Councillor Alsop about this, we talked about the process, and they're really this had been sort of the first time that we had considered something like this, and, and we've learned some important lessons, and we won't make those mistakes again uh, moving forward when it comes to process. Uh, I'll call the question. All in favor? It's approved. Move to item 8C, Council Information Matters, where Council may adopt consent items by one motion, but prior to consideration of such motion, members may request that specific items be removed from consideration under such motion, and Council shall consider such items individually. I'll go the other way around the table. Councillor Kelly? Yes, uh, 8C, 3B. 3B? Yes. Okay. Councillor Mollett? No, thank you. Councillor uh, Carr? No, thank you. Councillor Feeney? Sorry, go ahead. You said no, thank you? Okay. She said no, thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson? No, thank you. Councillor Alsop? No, thank you. Councillor Sanderson. No, thank you. And Councillor McCaw. No. All right, so then uh, that the following agenda items be received, save and accept item 8C3B. Moved by Councillor Alsop, seconded by Councillor Kelly. All in favor? It's carried. 8C3B, request the provincial government work with the federal government on a bilateral agreement to ensure the new national child care program be available to Ontarians. It is the November 15th, 2021 resolution from the City of St. Catharines. It is moved by Councillor Kelly, looking for a seconder, Councillor Sanderson. Councillor Kelly, you had raised that item. Go ahead, sir. Want me to stand? stand? Uh, no, you're, we're still in committee. Okay, all right, thank you. Of the Through whole. you, uh, Mayor. Uh, thanks to uh, St. Catharines for bringing this to uh, our attention, just to kind of bring everybody up to uh, my connection with this. I'm a board member with uh, Family Space Ontario Early Years. And last Wednesday at our meeting, we discussed this. Uh, and then in our package on Thursday, we received uh, the letter from St. Catherine's Council about the National Child Care Program, uh, where the federal government has committed $34 billion to uh, child care, and provinces and territories uh, have signed up. Ontario has yet to. And uh, I just wanted to give you some information about our area. And these are numbers that I received from uh, the County of Hastings last week. Uh, they have 506 program staff employed in Hastings County in licensed child care programs. There are 55 licensed home child care providers. 717 children are currently on a wait list for licensed child care. And that wait list numbers are high due to the lack of qualified staff. There are part, uh, approximately 1,634 kids currently attending licensed child care. And the federal government announced part of their platform, a national child care plan, and this has been long overdue, where it would be $10 per day for families. So 
You know, it's tough. I just spoke to a mother today that had to quit her job recently uh, in Belleville uh, because of uh, some school challenges with a timetable and uh, in classroom and uh, online learning. So the mother um, had to give up her job, just couldn't get someone to look after her child in certain hours when uh, the uh, young lad got home from school. So the province of Ontario is set to receive $10.2 billion in funding to help develop affordable childcare for families. And we need Minister Smith and Premier Ford to work on an agreement with the feds. Uh, Minister Leche is involved with this as well, the education minister. And this is really important. Childcare is key for families. Uh, as I look around the table, I believe Councillor uh, Alsop would be uh, the only one on this team with young children and daycare, if they're not yet, they will be uh, going into a program once they're in school and you'll be certainly happy to know with family space in Ontario early years, all qualified child care providers um, where there's rules and regulations. And I just hope that the uh, province can move on this quickly. It's really important. Uh, we've seen Minister Smith lately uh, with lots of funding for different programs here, Quinney Arts Council or uh, infrastructure funding. Um, maybe, hopefully, by the end of 2021 or early in 2022, Minister Smith will have some information and announcement on uh, working with the federal government on $10 a day child care because it really matters. If you do stuff in politics when you can help families out, this stuff really resonates with people and it matters. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, discussion. Uh, I'm going to recognize Councillor Feeney first and let's, let's just make sure we get you set up. Uh, go ahead, try this. <laughs> I just want to say thank you very much, Councillor Kelly. It's a huge issue in our community and, you know, for presenting the information that you just did and being a champion in that area. Thank you. Okay, great. great. Um, on discussion, Councillor Sanderson and then Councillor Alsop. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, certainly uh, support the, uh, the resolution from the City of St. Catharines. I'll just wait till they're finished. Yeah. Are you done? Yeah, go ahead, okay. Councillor Sanderson. Uh, so, yeah, certainly support the uh, resolution from the City of St. Catharines. And uh, I think with the announcement today that New Brunswick uh, has now introduced it and uh, the Prime Minister uh, made a bit of a speech there, I think Ontario may be the only one that's remaining. Uh, so uh, I certainly support it, and the sooner the better. But what was disturbing in today's announcement with New Brunswick is that the Prime Minister said he would get to $10 a day 10 years from now. And I'll tell you, that's just not good enough. So hopefully there'll be some pressure brought to bear to get this thing in sooner rather than later. And that could be why our Premier is, uh, is in negotiations with the Prime Minister because if that's what was being presented to me, I wouldn't accept it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Alsop. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to speak to this issue as I have three kids uh, under two and I'm terrified for what the cost of uh, childcare will be. Um, obviously, this is an issue for a lot of families. Um, you know, the median uh, income in Belleville, I think, is still about $33,000 a year. If you take a look at, um, you know, what childcare costs are now, uh, you'd be much further ahead in most cases to stay home than to... Uh, to pay out, especially for three or more children. Um, and it is, it is a family issue. It's a quality of education issue for children. It's also largely a, a women's issue as well. I mean, if you think about female-led households, single mothers, it really hampers their ability to participate in the economy and in the workforce. If they're having to give up what would be essentially all of their salary to be able to have someone watch their children, um, it's, it's a big problem. I'm glad that this is going to be addressed. Certainly, I hope that we get the, the funding for Ontario. Um, and uh, as soon as possible, and, and not in 10 years, as, uh, as Bill alluded to, that, that's too long. Good, great. Anyone else on this item? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? It's carried. So um, we'll move now to a motion to rise and report. Moved by Councillor McCaw, seconded by Councillor Alsop. Uh, all in favor? It's carried. 
and we'll deal with bylaws. And Councillor McCaw has raised a, a conflict with bylaw number 193. So I'll ask you just to leave the room and we'll deal with that and then separately. And so I uh, first reading of bylaw number 2021-193, which is a bylaw to approve and, and authorize the execution of a loan agreement between the Corporation of the City of Quinney West and the Corporation of the City of Belleville and the Quinty Humane Society, the Hastings Prince Edward um, uh, Humane Society. Uh, mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Sanderson, seconded by Councillor Kelly. All in favor, it's carried. Second reading of bylaw number 2021-193, moved by Councillor Alsop, seconded by Councillor um, Sanderson. Uh, any discussion on this item? All in favor, it's carried. And third and final reading of bylaw number 2021-193, Moved by Councillor Alsop, seconded by Councillor Carr. All in favor, it's carried. And uh, we'll just wait for Councillor McCaw to come back in. All right, so we'll deal with the rest of the bylaws and I'll just go through the numbers if it's possible, if it's okay with everybody. So bylaw number 2021-187, 188, 189, 190, 191, 192, 194, 195, 196, 197, 198, 199, 200, 201, and 202. Can I please get a mover and a seconder? Councillor Alsop and Councillor Kelly, all in favor? It's carried. Second reading of bylaws Number 2021-187, 188, 189, 190, 191, 192, 194, 195, 196, 197, 198, 199, 200, 201, and 202. Mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Sanderson and Councillor Thompson. Discussion on these items. Councillor Sanderson, if you just want to identify which bylaw you uh, want to speak about first, and uh, maybe we give a brief description for anybody watching so they understand what sure. we're talking about and then we can move into it. Thank you. So bylaw 2021-194, which is uh, the bylaw to uh, amend the speed limit on Farnham Road. Sure, go ahead, thank you. So the, the bylaw is being, or the bylaw is gonna reduce the speed from 60 kilometers to 50 kilometers along the entire stretch of Farnham Road. So I just wanna acknowledge and thank uh, Transportation Chair Councillor Thompson and his committee for the great work they've done in terms of moving us forward. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else on any of these bylaws? Councillor Carr. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, 192 is the uh, authorize the conveyance of land and execute a deal uh, with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, council last term had to buy up a lot of property to uh, have a successful Sydney Street Bell Boulevard corridor project and this vacant piece of property now that the city doesn't require we had to remove a house but we have an opportunity now to provide some land which we uh, don't always have an opportunity to do so I think when we when we are able to do it we should be certainly highlighting and uh, look forward to see uh, what Habitat does with that property. Thank you. Great thank you and I'll just uh, point out we're not just conveying it to them we're donating it to them and I believe the amount is for two dollars so uh, they get a they get a piece of property that they can now provide housing much needed affordable housing in the city of Belleville and it's it's great and uh, very proud of the last council and this council for making that happen anyone else in any items under the bylaws all right I'll call the question all in favor it's carried so third and final reading of bylaws number 2021-187 188 189 190 191 192 194, 195, 196, 197, 198, 199, 200, 201, and 202. Uh, moved by Councillor Alsop, seconded by Councillor Carr. All in favor, it's carried. So we'll move now to new business. And um, I'll just start off by, excuse me, I'll just take a moment uh, to thank again our residents and business owners for adhering to the COVID-19 regulations that continue to be in place. I know the restrictions continue to impact our daily lives and I certainly appreciate everyone's cooperation. City Hall continues to be open to the public from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. However, online phone and Dropbox services continue to be offered as an alternative to coming into City Hall. The public is encouraged to continue utilizing these options whenever possible. 
Those wishing to meet with engineering, planning, and building officials on the second floor or looking for marriage, license, and commissioner of oath services are encouraged to call ahead. The identification and proof of COVID-19 vaccination policy for entrance to municipal buildings continues to be in effect. At this time, individuals 12 years of age and older wishing to enter city buildings are required to provide personal identification and proof of COVID-19 vaccination each time they seek entry into a city building. The province of Ontario has announced that proof of vaccination will continue to be in effect indefinitely and the city of Belleville will continue to require this proof of vaccination status for entrance to our municipal buildings. The Belleville Public Library continues to be open to the public. Traditional library services continue to be exempt from the vaccine passport system and other essentially designated services such as public transit. The Quinney Sports and Wellness Center also continues to be open and offering many recreational programs. Check their website for more information at qswc.com. And I also want to share that effective immediately all persons must be seated to consume food or beverages and can no longer be standing in the facility. Please note that pre-registration is required. Sorry, let me finish up. They, in order to consume food or beverages, you must be seated and you are no longer able to remain standing while consuming those beverages. So just to be clear, that's a, a policy that's effective now immediately. Please note that pre-registration is required in most cases to use the Quinney Sports and Wellness Centre and, and again, uh, all persons entering must show proof of vaccination. The provincial vaccine booking system remains open and the vaccination centre located at the Quinney Sports and Wellness Centre continues to operate under the management of public health and our Quinney Sports and Wellness Centre team. As of November 25th, the Quinney Sports and Wellness Centre clinic location is also now open to children five years of age and older. And as a council, we remain collectively and singularly focused on the health and safety of our residents in all of our decisions. We thank everyone for their cooperation and support of our efforts and encourage everyone to get vaccinated as soon as they are able to. Please note that City Hall will be closed for all statutory Christmas holidays. Check our city website for exact hours. And lastly, um, as I finish with uh, these up to this important information, I need to acknowledge the efforts of city staff uh, emergency services and the employees of Alexicon Energy and Hydro One for their work over the weekend and uh, continuing into this week. We had a serious windstorm on Saturday uh, which continued yesterday and even today and there has been significant damage uh, caused by fallen trees, fallen power lines and power outages. I want to thank everyone who has worked all weekend including uh, throughout the night to assist with cleanup, restoration of services and repairs to facilities and homes. All of us appreciate the work that was done on our behalf and we're grateful to have such dedicated people at our service. In response to the debris left over from the storm, Transportation and Operations General Manager Joe Reed made the decision to open the Leaf and Yard Waste Depot at 75 Walbridge Crescent yesterday to allow uh, homeowners to be able to dispose of their debris. Um, and uh, uh, it was also open today from 7.30 to 3.15. Um, we thank everyone for communicating, helping to communicate this information uh, and I'd also like to point out that the Leaf and Yard Waste Depot will be open throughout the week, uh, tomorrow through Friday from 7.30 a.m. to 3.15 p.m. and on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And again, we appreciate everyone's efforts on that. Colleagues, anyone else have any new business items they wish to raise? Councillor Carr. Yes, thank you. <coughs> and uh, I premise this with the uh, the fact that I know that our health care and our, and our public health teams have been doing tremendous work with vaccinations. I am hearing no uh, seniors in particular that are eligible for their third booster. When they're calling the provincial booking system, they're getting um, uh, to directed to Colburn or Peterborough for appointments. And the question being posed is, uh, why is there uh, no appointments uh, in the Belleville area? Um, some feel comfortable driving, others don't, and particularly given the time of year and how the weather can change, uh, they're a little hesitant to book an appointment uh, with the, if suddenly there's a snowstorm. Do we have any idea whether we're having capacity issues, staffing resources? I know earlier in our agenda there was a, a community that indicated they were struggling with public health and needed extra funding and resources. Uh, do we have any indication as to um, the capacity we have locally here for providing uh, third boosters in particular that I know are going to become quite popular once uh, 18 and older are eligible uh, January 4th. Well, 
I, I think it's a good question, Councillor Carr, and I would uh, I know that Councillor Sanderson and Councillor Kelly serve on the, the health unit board for us. Um, what I would say is in the same way that we had the initial rollout of the first and second doses, people need to be patient, and if you are not getting an appointment that's in, uh, in our community, to check in a little bit later. And I know it's frustrating, but you know, we have uh, third booster shots that are being provided at the Queen Sports and Wellness Center. You can also get them at your local pharmacy and some do doctor's offices. And uh, just like in the first round, there was a huge um, surge in terms of people going online. I know that this morning there were many people who were not able to process their uh, third boosters if they're 50 years of age and over and they've had six months. So it'll just take a couple of days for it to sort of settle down. Um, but I think that uh, Councillors Kelly and Councillor Sanderson, if they could uh, raise that with um, Dr. Timoshe and the team to find out if there is a local workaround that we might be able to assist, particularly people who may have some uh, hesitancy with technology. They're not as familiar with it and we want to be sympathetic. Uh, and I am on a call on Wednesday this week uh, with uh, Hastings Conservative Health Unit and I will raise the question as well uh, for you. and. Uh, and we'll try to communicate that through the city's uh, channels as soon as possible. Okay, anyone else for new business? Councillor Thompson. Uh, I'm just going to respond to that if I may. Um, on Sunday, I booked two appointments for the third vaccine, and both of them were the Shoppers Drug Mart, and both of them were on January 30th. And on when we went on that website, there was about seven or eight openings on that one day. We could have booked the next day also. So I think if you go on the website, uh, you might find it a little different, but we found that on Sunday that we booked both of them. Okay, anyone else on uh, any other items of new business? Okay, so uh, we'll now move to motions. Uh, and at the last meeting, we received notice of motion from Councillor Carr uh, for uh, a motion. So Councillor Carr, I'll ask you to um, read out your motion, and um, then we'll look for a seconder, and we can have discussion on it. Yep, so uh, where's Transit Route 9 and Ward 2 will require a permanent funding source in the latter half of 2022 and beyond. It's requested the City Council prepare a resident survey for Council's consideration and approval regarding area proper, property owners' willingness to fund this transit route partially through property taxes as part of service expansion, after which the survey results be included in the 2022 operating budget agenda. Okay, so um, the motion is uh, proper to be considered. Uh, before I ask for a seconder, just let everybody know, uh, the motion, uh, the intent can be um, amended, uh, not the intent, but as long as it doesn't change the intent, there can be, we can consider amendments to it. And Councillor Carr, at the outset, um, I wonder if I would ask you if you would uh, be prepared to amend the motion to have the survey for the entire city of Belleville rather than just Ward 2 residents? Uh, no. Okay, so uh, an amendment would be in order if someone wishes to make it at that point, but uh, Councillor Carr does not wish to do it on his own. Um, is there a seconder for the motion? Councillor Millette. Councillor Carr, go ahead on debate. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'll just make comment on the amend the suggestion. Uh, transit service in the majority of the city, in particular in Ward 1, uh, has been in some form since the 1800s, um, but it did actually become a, a municipal service in 1960 with the Bellville Transit Commission. So the service that that's being referred to is well baked into the city as well as uh, as funded partially through, through property taxes. What we're talking about here is a new expanded area and uh, when it initially was uh, presented to us 2019 there was a survey that was uh, circulated to area residents both an online and a written version and those results were quite clear 70 percent were opposed to transit service 70 percent were opposed to funding it through the property taxes. There was an appetite for uh, an on-demand service with a higher area rate. But having said that, the transit committee and then on to council uh, felt with uh, provincial gas tax, we have an opportunity to run the service and fund it till September 2022 with no impact on taxes. And then the other part is, is uh, with our uh, funding with our buses, uh, we were able to actually get five buses for the price of four, so we now have another resource. And so it just created the perfect opportunity to run the service out at no cost to see what ridership would be like and the uh, reception to the community. Uh, transit staff have told the committee that six months of ridership will give us a good idea as to the demand, the interest, 
but we all know that uh, riders don't pay the full freight, that it is subsidized through property taxes. Council has a decision to make during the operating budget of 2022. The question is, do we fund it through property taxes or we, do we let the, the provincial tax uh, funding burn out in 2022 and remove the service? The thing that we haven't really explored is the on-demand service that people were interested in. So with that, we have to make that decision in, at, at operating budget. I would like to have the additional information, updated information as to residents' interest. We have some ridership statistics but they're in their infancy and we've got a few more months to go before we get an, a better idea. The, the other side of it is um, we need to know whether or not they actually want to pay for the service through the property taxes. When we did the survey in 2019, it was theoretical. We didn't have the service out there. But now that we actually have the operating uh, buses out there seven days a week, I want to see if those opinions have changed and perhaps maybe in addition to ridership, do we have more interest? Because right now, what we have is 70% opposed. And so I'm looking for an update to, to that community feedback. Now, I can go and find that feedback, but then I don't wanna have questions posed to me as to the validity of the information. So by having staff create the survey, and then council review it and approve it, make sure that it's objective, make sure that it provides us with the information we need to make a decision in April, I think we owe it to the residents to consult with them and get their opinion. And at the end of the day, we're not committing to anything here other than we're voting either to hear from residents or we're, or we're voting no to not hear from residents. And that's the simple question. So, thank you. Great. On discussion, Councillor Millett. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I'm, I seconded the motion and uh, I seconded the motion at committee and uh, as will likely be noted, it lost at committee by a slim margin. Uh, I, I agree with my colleague, uh, Councillor Carr, who brought this up. This is a simple matter of uh, uh, informed consent for those who will be, as Councillor Carr said, paying the freight for this service. Um, uh, you know, it gives us a better picture come operating budget time. That's all this does is getting more information uh, combined with the ridership numbers that'll be in on that date, um, combined with the survey results to give us a better, more informed decision on whether or not that the uh, taxpayers of Ward 2 uh, will be paying the extra uh, taxation, if you will, to support the service. And that's all it's asking for is, you know, informed consent for those who will be paying the freight. So I'm certainly going to support it here. Uh, and I'm welcome discussion from my colleagues. Thank you. Discussion. Councillor Alsop? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, so I have received uh, a couple emails and uh, a few carrier pigeons from Ward 2 uh, in, in reference <laughs> to this issue. It's a little different out there. Um, and, and, you know, people did have an appetite for, for answering another survey and, and exploring this a little bit further. And so on that basis, I would certainly support the motion. Good. Anyone else? Councillor Kelly? Thank you, uh, through you, uh, Chair, Mayor. Um, thanks to uh, Councillor Carr for a little bit of a history lesson for all of us here today, 1960 with transit in Belleville. Um, the way I look at this is uh, I think it's important that the residents in Ward 2 have a voice and uh, the survey is that vehicle for them with this regarding transportation. Um, it was a week ago we agreed and supported a $10 million investment for Ward 2 residents. Uh, and I remember Councillor Carr using the term, it's got an urban feel to it in that particular neck of the woods for uh, Ward 2. Uh, we've seen the growth. Um, the survey that was done in 2019 is almost three years old. And think of the development the city's had there in Ward 2 in the last three years. So. Um, and this would not be the first time that we've gone to an online survey. We did this with the four ward system back last summer and uh, the results of the residents of the city spoke on that particular topic and now we're having a topic about uh, service for our residents. So I think like this is their opportunity to be heard and I don't see any 
They had reasons not to let them speak out with a survey and uh, the bus has been three months and I think the pilot project was in for a six month term to, to, to get a true reflection of what's happening. So I'm gonna support the uh, survey. I think it makes sense. Good, anyone else on this? Councillor Thompson. I'm gonna support the motion, but I in the survey, I would like to make sure that the in the survey there's some note about the accessibility uh, service being provided also in a thorough award if we go ahead with this and if we don't go ahead with it uh, through the survey or through our final decision the accessibility service won't be available in the in the thorough award also so as long as there's some note in there about the accessibility uh, bus service uh, in that survey that I'm quite happy to support it. Thank you. Councillor Sanderson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, first, uh, let me say that it's not a six-month trial. It was expansion into Ward 2. That's the portion of the city that's north of the 401. So at the, uh, at the September 23rd, uh, 21, uh, meeting of the Transit Advisory uh, Committee. A similar motion was brought forward by Councillor Carr and it was defeated. So I'm going to paraphrase here just a couple of comments that were made by committee members during the discussion of the motion that was brought forward under new business. Uh, the feeling was why do we need another survey? Uh, if we're going to survey Ward 2 residents and ask if they want to pay for public transit, we should survey Ward 1 residents and ask them the same question. And uh, another comment was, why don't we survey residents and ask if they want to pay for the public library? I've never used it, and uh, I have to pay for it, was one of the comments. So instead of supporting the decision of the committee, Councillor Carr immediately took to Facebook within hours and cast the decision and those members of the Transit Operations Advisory Committee who voted against the motion in a negative light, such that former Councillor Hitch Boyce weighed in point of order. commenting. Uh, Councillor Carr, your point of order? Yep, thank you. What is it? Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Sanderson refers to the fact that I disparage uh, members of the committee and all I did was report the facts there was no commentary there was no uh, indication as to my opinion on their particular views I was simply reporting what occurred in the committee let's keep in mind the committee is held within the okay. boardroom yeah. of the transit no, thank I, you I've heard an, I've heard enough uh, it's well, not a, a, Councillor Carr I've heard enough on the point of order uh, Councillor Sanderson said it cast the committee members in a negative light which is not disparaging it's a reflection of his opinion about this um, and point so it's, of not, order. it's not a point of order. Well, point of, I'll, appeal your, I'll appeal your decision then. Okay, really, okay? Yeah, and I want a recorded okay. vote, please. Yeah. So the, uh, the process that we have here on a point of order is that the, the motion is that the decision of the chair be upheld. Am I correct in that, uh, Mr. McDonald? Yes. So if you vote in favor, you vote to uphold the ruling of the chair. If you vote uh, opposed, that it would be, um, it would overrule the decision. Um, the only outcome would be that uh, Councillor uh, Sanderson would be required to issue an apology. So again, I explained uh, the, the, perp the reasons of my uh, of my ruling, and so it's a recorded vote. So, Mr. McDonald, when you're ready, I get to we'll I get to comment on. Uh, that. No, we, you have already. Uh, no, Mr. I haven't. McDonald. Not on this point of order. I haven't. Mr. McDonald, I'll, I'll set the point vote. of order all night. If we want to debate the rules here, Councillor Carr, come to order. Okay, I will. There Councillor is, Carr, two come point to order, orders. please. Second like time. Mr. McDonald, call the vote, please. Councillor McCaw? Yes. Councillor Sanderson? Yes. Councillor Thompson? No. Councillor Alsop? Yes. Councillor Carr? No. Councillor Feeney? I'm sorry, Councillor Feeney, just give me one second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. As I just said, I'm very confused about what just happened here. What am I voting on? You're Something voting on a, a, an appeal of the ruling of the chair. 
Um, if the, the question is, the motion is to sustain the ruling of the chair. Yes is to uphold the ruling. No is to uh, up, uh, overrule it, um, as I explained. I will uphold your ruling. So it's yes. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Kelly. I think this is all ridiculous. Council, uh, it's yes I'll or no, unfortunately. Pardon? Yes or no, unfortunately, is all you can say. Again, I think this is ridiculous, uh, and I Councilor, will say... Councilor Kelly, yes or I'll no. say no. Thank you. Councilor Millet? No. Mayor Panchuk? Yes. How does he get the vote on his own rule? Motion carries. Okay, uh, Councilor Sanderson, resuming debate. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So I'll, uh, I'll start where I left off at the previous paragraph, uh, which uh, instead of supporting the decision of the committee, Councillor Carr immediately took to Facebook within hours and cast the decision and those members of the Transit Operations Advisory Committee who voted against his motion in a negative light, such that former Councillor Edge Boyce weighed in, commenting, why did the motion fail? Who voted against receiving more information to make an informed decision? Councillor Carr responds, I presume there was no further interest in resident feedback via survey. Now that my road is in, now that the road is in operation, I appreciated Councillor Millett for seconding my motion and public member Michael Harris for supporting the motion. To put an end to the nonsense, I replied to Edge Boyce that it was discussed in Point voter. of order. Yes. Point of order. So, Councillor Sanderson is providing an opinion and nonsense might be his opinion but yet he can't cast that opinion as being the opinion of everyone and so I'm concerned with the fact that he's characterized comments that I've made on social media as nonsense if we want to get to that level okay. then we can buckle down and we can go nonsense yeah, yeah. all day let me and just, I don't think that's appropriate yeah. we shouldn't be doing that thank you Councillor Carr let me just uh, consider that So I'm, I'm reading again uh, the, the rules or the description of point of order, and, and I recognize that uh, there's also the point of personal privilege. And um, the chair requires everyone's cooperation in order for us to have orderly meetings of council. And uh, as you know, I have been um, consistent throughout this term about re requesting that people uh, speak respectfully and, uh, and whatnot. Um, you know, when I look at item 4.71, a member may raise a point of order any time for a breach of the rules, a deviation from the matter under consideration, noting that the current discussion is not within the scope of the motion on the table, or any other informality or regularity in the proceedings of council. Now, that tells me that this is, again, not a point of order. It might be a point of personal privilege where a member may rise and, um, and state that they feel his or her integrity or the integrity of the council or the integrity of a committee or the integrity of anyone present at the meeting has been called into question by another member or by anyone present at the meeting. And while this is not what we're discussing now, um, you know, preemptively I might suggest that that is probably more likely uh, the case. And so um, I will rule that this is not a point of order, but I will ask Councillor Sanderson um, to withdraw his remark um, about, um, I'm, I'm, I, again, it's been a while, so I forget. If, if you said the term or something along the lines of stopping the foolishness, yeah, I, um, I have if, no if I can ask I have, you to withdraw that, I have no just, just say that you, know, you, you, don't, you didn't like what was going on or whatnot, and then we'll just try to continue on in a respectful uh, manner so that we can have discussion in which I recognize that people may not agree, and that's fine that we don't agree and it's fine that we have strong feelings, but um, there are things that we can do to help the conversation, including uh, interjecting on points of order when it is clearly not a point of order and at least getting the right term of what the appeal is correct. So I will rule that is not a valid point of order. 
Councillor Sanderson, you have the floor on debate, and I'd ask you to withdraw that comment, please. So, so the comment, and I will withdraw it, was to put an end to the nonsense. So I will withdraw that comment. Thank you. And I apologize for the offense that's obviously incurred. So I replied to uh, Edge Boyce. I said that it was discussed and voted on by the Transit Operations Advisory Committee, of which Councillor Carr is a current member. The decision to expand public transit had already been made and implemented, so no further surveys were deemed warranted. The question of how public transit is to be funded is a decision for Council, and as Chair of the Finance Committee, I can advise that we are reviewing the financials to be able to inform and make a recommendation to Council through the budget process early next year. Funding for Route 9 in Ward 2 is already in place through September 2022 without a tax impact. And hope this helps and thank you for your continued interest in our community. So since the introduction of uh, Route 9 in September, ridership has been steady and public transit is a significant and essential municipal service which now provides ridership connectivity across our full urban area and the need continues to rise. So it's not about whether I'll use it or you will use it, it's about whether you believe public transit is an essential municipal service. So can you imagine our city without public transit? Can you imagine paying to subsidize public transit in Ward 1 for 20 years without ever receiving the service. Well, that's what Ward 2 residents have been doing for 20 years. They've been paying for public transit and they haven't received it. So one has to, one has to ask, you know, where was the representation for Ward 2 residents for those two decades? Ward 2 residents now have public transit and the feedback I've received has been mainly positive but there are some totally opposed. Personally, I have no desire to drive a wedge between Ward 1 and Ward 2 residents. So if council doesn't already know the answer and wants a survey to find out if taxpayers want to pay for public transit through taxes, then it should include all residents of the city. And just a hint to what the survey may confirm, I receive complaints from residents having to pay $3 for a garbage bag tag. Can anyone around the horseshoe name five residents in the entire city who want to pay more taxes? Of course not. So if you believe public transit is an essential municipal service, then we have to pay for it as it benefits all our residents. You don't need a survey to tell you that, and all residents should pay their fair share. Thank you. All right, thank you. On uh, discussion, uh, anyone else? Um, okay, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, through you, Mayor. I, I just wanted to follow up on uh, some comments from Councillor Sanderson. Um, it is not my opinion that uh, um, I don't believe that bus service for War II residents uh, is in place. All I'm supporting is that a survey be done. And I don't see any harm with it. It's, we talked to the talk, why don't we walk the talk? We talked about a survey for ward, for the four wards that you championed last spring and summer. You were on your social media tweeting it and putting it on Facebook, it seemed every five or six minutes. Councillor Kelly, uh, when we debate, so why don't we Councillor support Kelly, when we have discussion, we do it through the chair. So please direct your comments to me, not to through Councillor Sanders. So all I'm suggesting, this to me, we've been discussing this for 40 minutes. The way I look at this, we're asking the residents of Ward 2 to see if they're in favor of transportation service being offered. And I get what you're talking about, uh, that it hasn't been there, now it's there. We've got a long road to go yet. Uh, it's only been in three months. Um, but this, to me, just seems really easy to say, let's go the survey route, because I know you love it, and, and let's Kelly, see what the results are. Councillor Kelly, you. Um, you know, again, if you want to participate in the debate, we've got to follow the rules. 
The rules are clear. You direct your comments to the chair. And it's now been three years that we've been sitting around here following the rules. We need to follow them. Part of directing your comments directly to somebody else is it escalates the emotions, and we don't, that doesn't help the conversation. All right, before I make my comments, and then Councillor uh, Carr will finish off. Uh, Councillor McCaw, did you have anything you wanted to say? Okay, so, um, you know, just uh, uh, my, my, my comments are that, uh, you know, as we did the ward survey, we, we oh, I'm sorry, I think, so, thank you. I'm gonna uh, recognize Councillor Feeney, and then we'll move on. I apologize, Councillor Feeney. This conversation. Okay, as someone, who relies on public transit, okay, um, it is very important service. And yes, we need to have input from uh, residents and whatever, but it is extremely important. Let's not lose sight of that. What we have, I mean, I've lived in different cities and we have a wonderful public transit system here and I was so excited to be on that you know, virgin voyage for number nine to go to Thurlow. And you remember yourself and those that were on the bus, that young man that was going to Loyalist College that w was so happy to be able to uh, get on the bus and be part of our transit system. So if we need a survey, okay, let's not bite about it. Let's be in support of this vital service that we provide to our city. All right, thank you, Councillor uh, Feeney. Um, you know, so uh, at the beginning of this term, uh, this council made a deliberate decision that we wanted to see the expansion of transit um, and to, uh, to expand it into the urban parts of the city, which include parts of Thurlow Ward. Uh, we made this a priority. Uh, as we structured the transit committee, it was done intentionally. Uh, to include both uh, Ward 2 councillors and some communicators because we had to make the case and to explain it. Um, and, and it's disappointing that uh, we would, um, you know, be, be embarking down a road where the focus of including transit as a core service in the entire urban part of the city would be something that, would un that potentially could unravel. You know, um, this is as much a discussion about what urban services should be part of the core rates as anything else. Because if we allow the city to become a smorgasbord or a buffet of different services and people are going to decide what they want, you know, where does it begin and where does it end? Police, fire, parks and recreation, transportation, library, all of these items are ones in which residents at different levels of use have it. Um, but I know that, uh, you know, again, if we put out a survey and said, that, uh, for example, the Belleville Public Library, do people believe that the Belleville Public Library is something that should be part of the taxation level? Many people would say no, and then we would not have a library system. I think sometimes as councillors and members of council, we have to show some leadership as well in terms of what are those, those key, uh, key services. But let's go back and let's remember, because while it may have been a few years ago, it's not that long ago that uh, going into the pandemic, Belleville Transit posted record amounts of ridership and we were getting comments from residents in Thurlow Ward in the urban part of Thurlow Ward of people who could not get to Loyalist College. They were students that were now living in the area. They had no ability to get to Loyalist College. Uh, they were parents that were living with their children who had no ability to move somewhere else. And most importantly, we were getting comments from residents who required the mobility service. They needed disability services for mo Belleville Mobility, and we did not provide that because there was not transit service in that area. And so for all those reasons, we felt it was important, it was a priority for our council to proceed with introducing transit into Ward, into, into, uh, ward 2, into those urban areas. Now, I'm, I have no issue with asking a question uh, for people. You know, we used a questionnaire, as Councillor Kelly pointed out very successfully, with the Ward survey. But that was a citywide survey. We asked everybody. And I think this is a key issue that we should do as well, because this is a question about what type of transit system will we have? Is it part of the urban uh, services that we provide or not? And I think the survey should be expanded to be citywide. 
and I can't support a survey that will only have one section of the city. You know, the, the, the history lesson that we had about, about the establishment of transit and amalgamation uh, and, and what happened then. When did residents of Ward 1, or what we now consider Belleville Ward, when did they have an opportunity to give their feedback on the establishment or the expansion or the continuation of a transit system? They never did. And so if we're going to be asking residents of the city of whether or not we should expand and continue transit service, we should be asking everybody that question. And we should be prepared for the answer. And that's, that's my, my comment. Uh, I was hoping that we would have seen an amendment come forward that would amend the motion to uh, have it be a citywide um, a citywide uh, survey. Uh, because it's not, I can't support it. Uh, I would support the survey if it was citywide. Um, uh, because I think this is useful information, um, but I can't do it if we're only going to have a particular part of the city, um, and so I'll be voting no on this motion. Um, I see Councillor Alsap is raising his hand, and if he's proposing to make a, an amendment that it would uh, be citywide, uh, it would be an order and I would allow it, uh, but someone's going to have to make that motion for us to move forward. If the motion, as I said, that is now is not amended, I can't support it, not because I don't want to ask people, uh, not because I don't want to hear from people, but I think it's incomplete and insufficient that we're only asking a portion of the city. And uh, those are, are my thoughts. The last thing I would say is that transit is one of the most heavily subsidized services that municipalities provide all across the country. And we do so because we are trying to encourage behavior. You know, we just declared a climate emergency in the city of Belleville just a couple months ago. And here we are uh, removing an potentially removing an opportunity about, ex about having transit service, which would take more vehicles off the road, um, you know, and, and, and that along those lines. Again, if we're going to ask the question, we should ask everybody. Um, if we're going to ask the question, uh, then uh, we should understand that the feedback is going to be predictably, people are not going to want this. And then the question becomes what we're going to do with it. So uh, unless there is a uh, amendment coming, uh, I'll recognize Councillor Carr and uh, he'll close off the debate and we'll move forward. Councillor Alsop. Brief, brief question, Chair, before I would issue an amendment. Um, is the tax implication universal for the addition of the Ward 2 transit services or is it only for Ward 2 residents? So that's a good question and I'm going to ask Director Hines if she's prepared to answer the question. So um, currently, can you explain how the, um, the current transit um, uh, funding model and the taxpayer uh, support is determined uh, in Ward 1. Um, as Councillor Carr explained, we are using uh, federal, uh, ga uh, federal gas tax money for this trial project. Mm -hmm. And if that funding should be removed and then we bake that as part of the core services, what, uh, how would it be implemented in Ward 2? Okay, so presently we provide transit service uh, in the urban area and we have four billing tables for taxation purposes uh, and it's presently only, presently only uh, table one, which is basically Belleville urban area, is responsible for contributing to transit. So we have uh, three other remaining billing tables that do not pay for transit in their tax rates. Okay. And so just for Councillor Alsap, because we have Belleville urban, we have Canopton urban, we have uh, and rural, rural, and, and, rural. And, rural. and rural. So the two rural areas don't have trial service and wouldn't wouldn't have it. Uh, but the urban areas, one pays now through tax base, one does not, and we're doing a trial on that area. And if we were to extend it, we would have to pay for it. Does that answer your question, Councillor Alsop? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I believe that's that's sufficient. Thank you. Okay. Okay, if there's no amendments coming, Councillor Moellet. Thank you, Your Worship. And I, I just wanted to make one further comment um, because it seems to have been a recurring theme. This motion that I have seconded that Councillor Carr moved is not a referendum on transit in Ward 2, and, and I don't want anyone to mistake this. Uh, we want to see the results because come uh, time to deliberate on the 2022 operating budget, we're going to decide on whether or not the residents in that area are going to pay the tax to support that. It's simply gathering more information that if we find, as 
you suspected, Your Worship, that it may be negative if they have to pay. There may be other avenues of, of finding a way to support the service. I don't want anybody to, to think that anybody who is voting in favor of this motion is somehow voting against uh, transit service to some of the urbanized areas of Ward 2. This is simply to gather more information. And uh, again, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that a, a good number of my colleagues are going to support it. Well, Councillor Millett, you, you make a good point, but I think I'd like to get some clarification from the treasurer, uh, from the director. Um, you suggested that there may be other ways to pay for it. Um, so let's ask her, uh, in terms of the municipal model of financing our activities and operations, um, you know, we are restricted in terms of a time period for trial projects using gas tax monies. So once we end at the end of that trial project, um, are there alternative ways for us to provide that service than to have it taxpayer, be taxpayer supported? No. So presently, the trial route is being funded by provincial gas tax. That funding mechanism permits us to, uh, to use it for operating initiatives like a trial service, and it can be done for the first year. Following the first year, the municipality is required to find the financing for the program from there on. Uh, I'm not aware of any other, any other uh, funding stream which would pay for the service except taxation. And presently, transit is approximately 67% funded through um, through taxes. So that has to be picked up by the taxpayers who receive the service in the areas. So, so Councillor Millette raises a good point, which is that if we had alternatives uh, before us now to find different ways to pay for transit in Belleville Urban, we certainly would, because that is a heavy taxpayer burden. But there, there aren't any. So. Um, you know, we go down this this road, and, and when people say this is just, we're just asking the question. Well, okay. Well, what if what if we get the expected result? Then are we prepared to say that in spite of 70 or 80 or 90 or 99 percent responses, we still uh, believe as a council that it's our responsibility, consistent with our declaration of a climate emergency, uh, the focus on the provincial and federal governments about getting uh, more vehicle on more people onto public transit, are we so prepared to go ahead with it? If, if we have people saying, you know, it doesn't matter what the results are of the survey, we're still going to provide transit in Ward 2, regardless of what the results are, that's one thing. But, you know, again, if we're going to do that, we really should ask everybody. Because, um, you know, it's, it's not fair to residents in the city of Belleville that we're only going to ask some, but not others, for them to tell us, which, you know, we, like I'm pretty confident, they're going to say, I don't want to pay for it. I never use it. Councillor Millett. Indulge me one last sure. time, Your Worship, because uh, uh, others. Well, you've been very polite, so I certainly will. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. A again, uh, you know, this vote does not preclude the fact that um, some or most or all of us come budget time in the spring for the operating budget aren't going to support uh, the taxation mode for, to support it. All we're asking is combined with, we'll have a more fulsome picture of the ridership numbers at that point. We'll also have the results of this survey and we'll have those two vital pieces of information before us when we make that decision. And that is all we're doing at this point. And again, I'm not, this is in no way, shape or form a referendum on uh, taxation supported transit for Ward 2. It's just simply getting a better picture because it is a new service. Thank you. Well, I will hold you to that, and I'll remind you during <laughs> operating budget when it comes up, Councillor Millett, those exact words. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sanderson, and I would like to sort of bring this to a conclusion. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, but given we're making a second round here. So when the, um, if, if we do the survey, and I think it should also include uh, the entire city, and I've said that, and I don't know whether I can make an amendment to Councillor Carr's motion or not, but if you, I... You can if you wish. Okay, so, uh, so I will do that. But, but first, if we do the survey, we're really going to be misleading the tax base and the residents who fill it out and say, I don't want to pay for it on my tax bill. Well, let's say it's the same as the results we had on the first survey, 75%. So 75% people say, no, we don't want it. And council says, 
it's, a muni it's an essential municipal service, which I believe, and so we're going to do it and you're going to have to pay for it. Then they're going to say, well, Jesus, you, asked, you gave me the survey, I filled it in, and then you ignored me. So that, that you know, it's so... <sighs> anyway, so, okay, so... I would like to make an amendment to the motion that it include the entire city, all residents. Okay, so uh, Mr. McDonald, can you just give me a little bit of direction? So uh, the amendment on this would be to... Um, change the motion to say that a citywide survey, that city staff prepare a, a, a citywide resident survey? Would that be recommend? So so the motion would stay as is and we would insert, well, um, we would insert um, after prepare uh, a citywide resident survey for council's consideration. So it's moved by Councillor um, Sanderson. The, the amendment is in order. Uh, is there a seconder for it? Councillor McCaw has seconded. So the discussion on the amendment that the survey now be citywide. Councillor Alsop. Thank you. Quick, uh, quick point of clarification here. So we're moving to uh, asking everyone in, in Belleville whether or not we should have, uh, whether or not they would support uh, taxation for Transit Route 9 and Ward 2. But my understanding of my initial clarification was that Ward 1 taxes will not be affected by the Ward 2 transit and that currently Ward 2 is not paying for Ward 1 transit. Did I understand that yes. correctly or I thought I made a mistake? So we're going... So you are correct. Ward 2 are not paying because right currently now, for transit. Because it's being funded through the provincial gas tax money used as a pilot project or a test project. But would we be moving to a situation where Ward 1 is subsidizing Ward 2 Transit? Because then also Councillor Sanderson had noted before that Ward 2 for 20 years has been subsidizing Ward 1 Transit. But if I'm hearing that only one tax to taxation table is paying for it and that's the urban one, then that would not have been well, the case. Again, when we have these, this is our second pilot project in the last eight years, let's say. Um, both of those were using uh, Provincial, provincial or federal? Yeah. Provincial gas tax money that we've received right. that we could have otherwise allocated to other projects. So when the city of Belleville receives provincial gas tax, we receive it as a city, as a whole, a whole city. And when we decide to put it towards certain projects, um, you know, obviously the whole city benefits. In this case here, we have decided to put those funds towards a trial project or a pilot project of transit in toward two. And so the, uh, uh, those residents have been, have been contributing their, um, their share of the proportion, their proportionate share of the gas tax funds. Now, Councillor uh, Sanderson, I believe, is also speaking about other um, activities that are funded from the general tax base that indirectly is being paid by Ward 2. Councillor Sanderson, do you want to expand on that? Uh, no, what I, w what I was trying to do was uh, answer uh, Councillor Alsop's question. So currently, the way it's funded, uh, the Ward 1 residents pay. When you expand the service, you've now got economies of scale, and so therefore there would have to be a recalculation of the, the tax for Ward 1 and Ward 2. Given that there's more residents in Ward 2, you know, I wouldn't want to say it out loud, but I, I think there's a chance that their rate would come down slightly, and, but it would be fair across the entire two wards of the city. I think you meant to say there were more residents in Ward 1. Yeah, yeah that, that is. And so that it sort of works out. Does that answer your questions, Councillor Alsop? Okay. All right, anyone else on discussion? Councillor Carr. Yeah, on the amendment. So just give some history here. First public transit appeared on Balvo, May 23, 1876, with 16 horses and drivers operating from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And throughout the years, the service uh, appeared, disappeared, and of course, it was all private. 1924, Fred Rawson Sr. started one bus transit system. When he died in 1935, his wife and son drove the buses. And then after the Second World War, revenues dropped and the family sold the transit business to the city of Balvo. In 1960, the Balvo Transit Commission was formed. And as we were talking about the amendment and, and looking at the whole city. Again, we're talking about a transit system that has been in place and in structure for 60 years. 
we're talking about a brand new service that's just started. Um, we called it expansion, but Mayor, in fairness, you called it trial three times tonight. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's still in its infancy. The ridership is not where I think it should be, but we're early in that process. S staff have told us a six month mark will give us a good indication of where the ridership is at. We're not there yet, but that six month is gonna align with the budget. So the decision and, and the reason why the, the, the not going citywide is because you already have a built in system. When you bought your, when, sorry, when Councillor Alsop bought his house, he knew that there was transit there. When the folks, and I, and I referred to the numbers, you've got 1,500 in the two subdivisions off of Farnham Road. I would hazard a guess you would have maybe a little bit less, but a significant number between the two. Plus you have a lot of existing areas that have been there for years, 60s and 50s. And let's not forget, the bus doesn't run up 62, doesn't run up to Corbyville, which is all part of that same tax base. So we're talking about a new service in its infancy. In 2019, we asked for a survey. We asked for a survey exclusively for that area. I didn't hear any objections in 2019 that we were looking for a citywide. We wanted to know whether or not the service was something that they wanted to have, because we're not obligated to provide it. We can provide, we have, we're obligated to fire, uh, fire service and protection, but transit is essential if it's there, because you have to keep it running, but it's not essential in that you must have transit. So we did a 2019 survey. There was no indication that a citywide survey was required. It was simply because we were looking at a new area. Again, we're in the infancy, we're looking at new data. To expand it into a wider spectrum, you know, I guess you're gonna open up a bigger can of worms. If that's what we're prepared to do, um, then that'll be interesting. Uh, I think we have a lot to, uh, to gain through on-demand service. Everybody talks about climate change. Well, you can reduce a lot of GHGs if you've recalibrated your route to the most efficient route versus circling around, uh, picking up people at static spots. But to me, we're talking apples and oranges. We're talking an established service where people have bought into a neighborhood knowing they have it versus the majority of people up until three and a half months ago, if you hadn't moved into your home, you bought with the, the, the thought that there is not transit service. So again, this is in its infancy versus a well-established service in other areas of our city. All right, any more discussion on the amendment? The amendment. Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor of the amendment? Opposed? Amendment's defeated. So we're back to the original motion. Um, all right, I'm going to recognize Councillor Carter to wrap up discussion on the original motion, and then we'll have a vote. Thank you very much. Um, you... Anyway, I'm going to leave that. Um, I just have a question, though, and I, and I want to direct it through you to the director because I've heard this uh, around the table. Um, Ward 2 has been paying for public transit for 20 years. Is that true? Uh, Ms. Hines? So currently, we only charge uh, tax. Transit is an area-rated service. Transit uh, is currently only charged to the billing table, which is known as Belleville Urban, which basically replicates the service area for transit for the city of Belleville. Okay, so if I could, just as a follow-up and, and get a, just a different angle on that explanation. So um, when uh, Ward 2 residents pay their taxes, mm -hmm. and there's a general revenue portion to the taxes, or to general government, is there any general revenue that would spill into transit in the last 20 years? No, because transit is a tax, is an area rated service. Okay, thank you. I, I knew the answer to that question, but I think it needed to come from someone with authority in that area. Um, there was another question as to, uh, you know, paying for transit and where everybody's been for 20 years. Well, when I sat here in 2000 and 2003, two years after amalgamation, there was actually on the tran or on the tax bill was transit in Canfrey and you know, we can go back and look at that record. I raised it and said, we either got to bring the transit in or we got to remove it off the taxes. It was removed off the taxes. So that's what I was doing 20 years ago was making sure people weren't getting charged for what they weren't paying for. So again, when we're talking about the 2019 survey, there was never anybody around the table or at the, at the transit committee that suggested it should be area wide. This is a new area. We need to see the appetite 
And really and truly, ridership is one metric. The other one is whether people want to fund it and how they want to fund it. So going back to that 2019 survey, and I've got both results here, the online version and the uh, mailed-in version tally. And the last question on the survey was, if transit were offered in Ward 2 without a property tax increase, so the, the seed was planted, but a fare zone was added to the cost of each ride and then broke down different fares as a zone, uh, so basically a pay-as-you-go type system. The majority were in favor of that. So there is some appetite for transit. And what's lost here is we're getting into the weeds of what's going to happen with transit service in Ward 2 today. Nothing. We need more information, or at least I'm going to say I need more information. I want the ridership metrics. I want an update to the 2019 survey. The 2019 survey was hypothetical. If a bus went down your street, would you use it? Would you pay for it? And we got the result. We have a bus actually going, so there's no hypothetical now. Now it's a, oh yeah, you know what? I kind of like the idea that the bus is there. So does the appetite change? I don't know. The other thing that we didn't explore was the on-demand version and the pay-as-you-go version. So when we want to talk about GHGs and, and all the rest of the stuff that we should be doing, well, we should maybe be looking at recalibrating the routes to make them most cost-effective, user-friendly, and environmentally friendly. And as we continue to go down the in, uh, electrification of buses, okay, we're already hearing now that we're going to have to recalibrate our routes because the battery capacity is not there for the large routes. So we have to be creative. And so I think this is a launch pad for some creativity. And, and we've got an opportunity here with a quote trial service or however you want to call it. But it doesn't mean the elimination. It simply means asking for more information. So again, you know, good leadership in my books, I know I heard it from others, but is to represent people. And the best way I can represent people is to hear from them. And at the end of the day, they pay the bills. And they're the ones that put us here. So they deserve for some input. And then we need to take that information, we need to analyze it, and then we need to make some decisions on that. But without having it, I've got an old survey that says no, and I've got ridership statistics that are incomplete. I'm just looking for more information. I request a recorded vote, please. All right, so Councillor Carr's request a recorded vote. Uh, Mr. McDonald, whenever you are ready. And I'll remind everybody again, the answer is yes or no. Councillor Sanderson? Yes. Councillor Thompson? Not to approve the survey. Councillor Thompson, there's a motion that's on the floor. I'm sure you've been following along, so. Yeah, so is it yes or no? Yes. Councillor Alsop? Yes. Councillor Carr? Yes. Councillor Feeney? Go ahead, Councillor Feeney. Go ahead, Councillor Feeney. Whoops. Go ahead. Yes or yes. no? Sorry, I'm getting a huge amount of feedback here. So that we called the question on the motion. Uh, the choices are yes or no. It's the motion that Councillor Carr has made. So I'm looking for a yes or a no, Councillor Feeney. <laughs> so uh, it's no, in, in, by, by rule, it's, it's a no. Okay. Um, colleagues, if uh, Councillor is unable to vote, uh, it's ca counted as a no. So in the negative. Okay, uh, keep going, Councillor. Or, uh, <laughs> Councillor Kelly? Yes. Councillor Millette? Yes. Councillor McCaw? 
No. Mayor Panchuk. No. Motion carries. Okay. So we'll now move to announcements. Uh, colleagues, anybody have any announcements they'd like to make today? All right. Well, uh, I have uh, a couple of proclamations and then some uh, some announcements. I'd like to proclaim December the week of December 20th to 24th as Salvation Army Week. The Salvation Army Christmas Kettle campaign helps to fund local uh, vital programs, serving thousands of people in need in our community every year. I'm also pleased to proclaim that January 2022 will be Alzheimer Awareness Month. Alzheimer's and dementia affect several hundred families in the city of Belleville. Building more dementia-friendly communities can be our first step to help reduce the stigma of dementia in Canada. I urge all citizens of our community to become more aware and educated concerning the far-reaching effects of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, I'm pleased to proclaim 2022 as the year of the garden in celebration of the contribution of gardens and gardening to the development of our country, our municipality, and the lives of our citizens. City of Belleville Park staff are working on several garden initiatives to celebrate this important year, which will be announced in the months to come. Council approved last week at our capital budget funding for this extraordinary celebration in 2022. Uh, in terms of announcements, I um, was honored on November the 10th to attend the Elmwood Cemetery Remembrance Day ceremonies along with councillors Carr and Sanderson to remember those who fought for our country. And I was also honored to be part of the November 11th Remembrance Day ceremony that took place at the Belleville Cenotaph at Memorial Park. It is a special and a very important day each and every year, and I appreciate all those who continue to ensure the appropriate honour and respect is shown. Most members of council were in attendance along with several city staff and the executive team from the, from the Be uh, Belleville Police Service. It was a lovely day to celebrate the service of Canadians. On November the 16th, I was pleased to join the owners of Burger Revolution as they officially opened their new Belleville location here in downtown Belleville at 357 Front, Strip, uh, Front Street. Uh, this new Belleville location can seat more guests than their original Belleville location and includes an outdoor patio uh, for uh, better summer months. It was great to have councillors Carr and Feeney in attendance at that opening. The City of Belleville Lighting Display and Gateway Signage Committee hosted the launch of the 2021 Festival of Lights on November 17th in Market Square. And as always, I was honored to attend and to uh, light the display. This year, we were extra thankful for sponsorships provided by Fitzgibbon Construction and Reed Brothers Truck Service I hope, uh, and others. I hope that everyone has a chance to take in this year's amazing display. And a very special thank you to Councillors Kelly, McCaw, and Molette, um, and the community members of the committee who along with staff resource Sheila Alexander have done such a great job. This celebration has really taken off this term and I want to recognize uh, this amazing progress. On November the 17th, I was honored to attend a special event at the Boathouse Restaurant where we thanked outgoing owners Greg and Linda Ainsley for their years of hard work. New Boathouse owner Tom Mantis also revealed his future vision for the property located along South Front Street. Councillors Feeney, Millette and Thompson joined me to see the launch of the exciting future plans for this property. The Belleville Downtown Improvement Association annual general meeting also took place on November the 17th where I was pleased to address the dedicated and passionate members of the Belleville Downtown Improvement Association. I would like to congratulate Board Chair Catherine Brown and the members of their board including Councillor Alsop for the amazing work the BDIA has been conducting this term. Along with BDIA staff, uh, the members uh, of our downtown businesses have shown resilience and professionalism, marked by their being recognized with two provincial awards at the Ontario Business Improvement Association, AGM. This is the first time since the creation of the BDIA in 1972 that they've received this provincial recognition. Thank you to councillors Alsop, Kelly and McCaw for also being in attendance that evening uh, with me. On November the 18th, I attended a virtual YMCA Peace Medal ceremony where our very own uh, Belleville's own Eric and Liz Leightonen were recognized for their extensions of contributions to the Quinty region, uh, regional community, uh, showcased through their years of community service with the YMCA. A big congratulations to Eric and Liz and thank you for everything you do to support the city of Belleville. Uh, the kickoff for the Salvation Army Kettle Campaign took place on November the 18th. Uh, where myself and several members of council celebrated the start to this important giving season. 
I encourage everyone to give to this important cause when you see the Salvation Army kettles throughout the city. Uh, later this week, I will be honored to present a further contribution from Alexicon Energy for $2,000 and a $5,000 contribution from the City of Belleville for their important community activities. On December 7th, I joined Community Care of South Hastings to thank their amazing volunteers at their virtual volunteer appreciation ceremony. The Community Care of South Hastings serves and assists hundreds of seniors and people with disabilities right here in the city of Belleville to live independently at home by providing meals on wheels, medical transportation, home health, etc. Thank you to all those who volunteer. Belleville's newest salon and holistic and medical spa, Kita Beauty Lounge, hosted their grand opening on December the 8th at 112 Front Street. Congratulations and best wishes to the team, and Councillor Feeney and I were really pleased to be there for that opening. Lastly, in terms of announcements, um, my wife Lisa and I were so pleased to join the Pentecostals of Quinty last night for their modified Christmas service uh, called And Love Came Down uh, at the Dundas Street West Church. It was a wonderful get-together, again, to celebrate the holiday season and the message of hope. You know, um, many communities of faith will celebrate different holidays at this time of the year, and they all focus on health uh, and optimism for a better future. I want to take this opportunity on behalf of all of us on Belleville City Council to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas and best wishes for whatever holidays you celebrate. I encourage everyone to continue to be safe and that you will all have a very happy New Year. As this is the last meeting of the year, I will mention that I will continue to monitor the public health situation and make a decision regarding the New Year's levy scheduled for January the 8th in the near future. Regardless of the decision about proceeding with the event or not, we will communicate uh, this widely when the time comes. I also will, in the coming weeks, make a decision on the format for our January meetings. Um, we are scheduled to have two meetings in the month of January. Uh, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of Council to thank the amazing women and men who work for the City of Belleville for all of their efforts in 2021. We are so fortunate to have such dedicated and passionate people who serve our city. To those who will be working during the holiday season to keep our services running and to protect our community, thank you and please be safe. Lastly, colleagues, I, I want to thank you all for your service to the citizens of Belleville in 2021. 2021 has been a very busy year, and we have continued our work in making Belleville a better place for all who live here. We have managed the affairs of our community during an incredibly difficult time, and so I want to thank each of you for your efforts and wish you all a joyous, peaceful, and restful holiday season. And unfortunately, the items that I had ordered to be able to give you this evening have not arrived <laughs> due to the worldwide shipping issues that we are seeing. But I am certainly hoping that they will arrive before the 24th of December and you can expect a special delivery to your homes so that uh, you, can, uh, you can have them. Um, but as I said, you know, we have done uh, such great work this year and we have much more work to accomplish in 2020 and I look forward to the new year with great anticipation. Merry Christmas to you and your families and all the best for a happy new year. And with that, I will ask that uh, bylaw number 2021-203 a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council at its meeting held on December 13, 2021 be read a first, second, and third time, and finally pass this 13th day of December 2021. Moved by Councillor Alsop, seconded by Councillor uh, Millette. All in favour? It's carried. A motion to adjourn. Councillor McCaw and Councillor Kelly. All in favour? It's carried. Thank you.